yeah, I try to limit myself to one eight ounce, eight to 12 ounce. 12 ounces is technically two cups, so I don't know. It's like a cup and a half, a cup is eight ounces. <laughs> so a coffee cup is six ounces. What? Mm -hmm. My life is a lie. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs>
my mom jeans outfit. So I don't know. Hmm. Vintage simplicity dress, wide leg pant, Adrian blouse. Which one would you get more wear out of? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> because I don't um, think I see you yeah. in that many pants. Yeah. Well, it's because you only ever see me from the waist up <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> that is also true. <laughs> no, you're right. I don't actually wear pants a lot. Um, that's true. I'd like to get – well, you know why I don't wear pants, though? Fitting. Yeah. Yeah. Ready to wear fit issues. Mm. Um, so I've never been a pants person. I do wear things below my waist, but they're not pants. <laughs> like, you know um, – and I do already have it cut, so I don't know. I, I think if you asked me, I'd probably get more wear out of the dress, mm-hmm. but that would be if I was in the office five days a week, mm-hmm. which I won't be. So and like, like tensile, ISO kind of swishy pants are comfortable. Even they if are. they are like, you know, they have a true waistband, they're not elasticated. I am a fan of the elasticated waist. <laughs> no, I think they are elasticated. Oh. So. oh. Even more compelling. Even more. I don't know why I haven't finished them. I really don't. Well, like, I can see why. Because you go in being like free pattern and like this will be great. And then the instructions are not clear enough for beginners. So then you're not inclined to want to keep going, which I think is a shame. I Yeah, I think on pure outfit looks. I'm personally a fan of the mom outfit and because I wear, I tend to wear pants more than dresses, but again, it, it, I think it's like the reverse problem of you, like mm-hmm. finding dresses that fit me for me to wear, like either the top is too small or the bottom is too big. And so yeah. like for me, I haven't really been into as many dresses until I was able to make them. So yeah, yeah I don't know, but I, I think from I guess I resonate style wise more with your mom's outfit. It's also it'd be fun to do a side by side. Yeah, and it seems like it'd be easier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, does she still have that outfit? Can she wear that? Like, can you do? Aww, no, I don't think so. I could probably make her the same outfit though. Ooh. Anyway, Halloween twinsies. I could be my mom. You could be your mom for Halloween. <laughs> Well, now that's a really compelling thing. I haven't done <laughs> I haven't done Halloween in years, so I think yeah, that's fun. I think we've made the decision. We'll see if I get it done by the time this episode comes out. Probably, <laughs> not. Probably not. And if not, then listeners, you tell me what you think would be fun to work on. Just stay tuned for Nicole's Nicole Nicole can make pants. We believe. Uh, yeah. uh, how about you, Ada? What are you working on? I am working on more sportswear (laughs) I picked up I really liked the pattern that I was working on last season I wanted to have like more variety though so I picked up another one and it's a big four pattern so not size inclusive either it's a current simplicity pattern and the numbers are 11087 which is different I know that's different from like the s numbers I don't know how the two systems are different but Mm -hmm. I've that's how I found it I know there is like an actual like s number it is a polo short sleeve and long sleeve version shirt and dress polo with like a mandarin collar and a zipper in the middle instead of just kind of an open placket so the other one I have is like a placket which was great for learning how to make a placket and this one is good for practicing zippers it just the way that the zipper they tell you to get a regular zipper but then they want you to install it like an invisible zipper which I didn't realize until I had gone halfway through the instructions for the zipper and I was like why am I not just doing an invisible zipper this is dumb so my first twall is in the it it, it is firmly in my um scrap bin right now scrap pillow because RIP the I mean the the fabric I was working with was like not a great polyester I just kind of found at the secondhand store I found like a yard so it's just enough it was a cute print but I'm not super heartbroken over it it's just the main the mangled zipper and mangled collar Mm -hmm. issue so also it it had like it told me to cut the back piece in like two instead of one and I was like why is there an extra seam here it seems kind of weird so we're gonna try it again and probably go more slowly and probably ignore more most of the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have the skill to be able to do that, right? Yeah. Now I'm like, I don't feel bound by this piece of paper. 
Yeah, I tend to do that with with big four, uh, certainly more than indie. Like I'm like, this is wrong, and then sometimes yeah. I'm wrong, like a lot of times. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I even I did a score. I also did a score from them, and I think it was the same collection. And I did a score from them, and I compared it to the score that I'd made previously. That was, I guess, technically indie, also Jay Lee. Mm -hmm. And even though the Jay Lee instructions weren't the clearest, to be honest, like they were very sparse, they were still better than the big four. (laughs) So, (laughs) like with a score, instead of you have to put the pant legs together, but then you have to put the pant legs into the skirt. And so there's like a, you have to have put one inside the other and then Mm -hmm. sew it around the waistband. And the way that the big four pattern had it, I was just like, who would read this? Like what human being would read this and say, this makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) So that one, that one we are also working with. So unfortunately more fitting and practice to do on those, but I'm treating it as, A learning opportunity. Well, I believe in you. Good luck. (laughs) Thanks. Before we get started on today's topic, I do want to cover a bit of feedback that we received in part two of our Mindful Fabric Selection episode. We got a message from Koss, who goes by with or without notice on Instagram, regarding a sewing fabrics notion and pattern store called Merchant and Mills based in the United Kingdom. You may be familiar with them. Koss brought up an incident that occurred back in May 2020 with this particular store. When the sewing community rose to support the Black Lives Matter movement, Merchant and Mills were asked to release a statement on anti-racism. They responded by saying that they needed some time to write one before releasing it. Unfortunately, nothing ever came out of this, despite several folks following up on the issue, including Koss and their friends. On the flip side, Merchant and Mills were able to respond fairly quickly when they were accused of fat phobia upon releasing a new sewing pattern uh, just a few months later. They apologized immediately and quickly re-released their pattern in an extended size range. After we received Costa's message, we checked out Merchant and Mills' Instagram account at Merchant and Mills. All we found was that hashtag Blackout Tuesday Black Square... Uh, posted with no statement on anti-racism to follow, and a post on Merchant and Mills becoming a member of the Better Cotton Initiative, an organization committed to sustainable cotton production. We just wanted to share this piece of information with you, much like what we've done in the past with other stores, fabric companies, and pattern designers like mood fabrics and of course this goes with the theme of episodes three and four which is mindful fabric selection beyond sustainability now it seems that merchant and mills works with different fabric manufacturers to stock and sell under their their name now pro tip this means that you may be able to find their fabric elsewhere without the quote-unquote merchant and mills branding on it now for instance You can buy their exact oil skin directly from some of their partnering mills in the UK for a fraction of the cost. So with a little bit of luck, time, and research, your money could go elsewhere and you could save a few bucks. And now on to today's topic. Today's topic is on imposter syndrome and its intersection with sewing. It's a term that gets thrown around a lot, and it's also a controversial topic, but we'll get into that later, and we'll try to give you, uh, we'll try our best to give you a well-rounded insight to the topic. First of all, it's not a mental illness, although it may occur in individuals with depression and or anxiety. It's not mentioned in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as the DSM-5, uh, 5 because it's the current version. The DSM-5 is a book that is used as a tool to classify and diagnose mental illness in individuals in the United States. Even though it's not considered a mental illness, it has been extensively studied and documented by psychologists and behavioral health institutions. And imposter syndrome is often a term that is used, especially when referring to women in the workplace, but there's definitely ways that it can manifest in your sewing practice too. So we are going to talk about how that might show up for you uh, for your sewing. And we will also briefly explore what the intersection is between being of Asian descent and having imposter syndrome, what that looks like. 
So what does imposter syndrome actually look like? Generally, individuals who have it believe they have fooled other people into thinking that they're more competent than they are. They also believe that their achievements are due to external circumstances, such as luck, rather than any of their internal qualities, such as their ability, intelligence, or skill. And lastly, because of these beliefs, many people with imposter syndrome have a fear of being exposed as an imposter. Now, fun fact, psychologists actually think the term quote, imposter syndrome should be renamed perceived fraudulence to highlight that this fear is unjustified because the word imposter implies that the individual who feels this way is actually a fraud, which they are obviously not. <laughs> like, I'm just thinking of um, Hamburglar, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like <laughs> someone putting on a mask and they're deliberately doing it, but perceived fraudulence, you know, puts the, I suppose, uh, puts the focus on the actual feeling and, and the right. rather than the acts of the person. And like we said earlier, imposter syndrome does get linked to depression and anxiety a lot, but there are other phenomena that you should look out for, such as overwork, perfectionism, fear of failure, discounting praise, and fear and guilt when you are actually successful. <laughs> All this makes me feel really seen right now, I gotta say. <laughs> I can already see a lot of ways that this can show up for someone who sews, right? It can show up as emotional burnout, especially for many of us who actively post about our sewing practice online, because we might feel like we have to be perfect all the time. And perfectionism can show up when we're making twall after twall after twall in hopes of getting perfectly fitting polos or skirts or even pants. I think trousers are like the most popular one where where we've seen a lot of that on Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps when we fixate on the imperfections in our makes when we finally do actually build up the courage to share them widely. On a related note, we might see a pattern of procrastination over time in our sewing practice because you know, not doing anything is a way to avoid failure, which can then be followed by a frenzy of overwork in order to keep up the appearance of perfection and as an attempt to kind of try to like prove that we belong in the sewing community. And I think some of that same fear of failure can also hold us back from attempting a challenging pattern or from cutting into our beautiful fabric, right? We are all guilty of sitting on or hoarding fabric that we are afraid to mess up for a project and just kind of coveting it for a while in our stash. That is a whole other issue I have to deal with. <laughs> I can think of some like so many things that I've saved for the right project. And um, you know, along with the overbuying and being more mindful that we we talked about in our sustainability episodes. Um it's so easy to buy fabric, but when it comes to actually using it, I do sometimes stop myself because I'm afraid of like, whatever I'm going to make won't turn out as beautifully as I wanted to in my head. Um, and sometimes it doesn't kind of like <laughs> what we were just talking about with what I'm wearing today. Like it's a fun fabric and it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, but you know, it's, we won't know until we try and it's better than just sitting on the shelf. Right. And there's no control Z on sewing. Yeah. Like once you cut the fabric, you can't undo that kind of fabric. No, and I guess that's what makes it kind of scary to move forward with actually, you know, going because you're worried about failing at it, which, you know, is certainly characteristic of imposter syndrome. And another way that the sewing world and imposter syndrome can collide is that feeling of guilt over time spent sewing. Like that time could have been better used elsewhere, uh, you know, which may be because you don't think your skills are good enough to warrant, you know, taking the time to sew. And this reminds me of the conversation that we had last season on sewing and self-care. Uh, if you haven't listened already, I encourage our listeners to go back and check it out. It was season one, episode four. And we talked a little bit about the supposed indulgence and in taking time to sew for yourself um, as self-care and why it's okay to make room for self-care in your daily practice. That was a fun episode. Erica, who is also a member of the collective, compared her sewing practice to the indulgence of eating chocolate cake. Mm -mm. And <laughs> I, I enjoyed that metaphor. I think when you lose your sojo, that can also tie into imposter syndrome. So for those not in the know, sojo is a word that many folks in the online sewing community like to use when describing the motivation to sew regularly. So sewing plus mojo, sojo. And if you've lost your sojo, it essentially means that you've suddenly lost that drive that keeps you sewing or keeps you working on sewing related things like cutting out patterns or planning out makes. And 
I guess I believe that some people lose their sojo because of all the emotional stress that we can get into when we think we have to get to a certain level of sewing, right? And social media doesn't really help here because we can be caught up, like Nicole and I have discussed, in the latest trending pattern on Instagram and being influenced there or, you know, feeling like we have to make something exactly the way that we saw it or or kind of getting into that comparison, right? And I am, for one, grateful to have Nicole and the rest of the collective to bounce ideas off of. It has certainly helped me level up as a sewist. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for example, over the last few weeks of summer, there were quite a few, not even the last few weeks of summer, all throughout the summer, there were quite a few new dress pattern releases in the indie pattern world. And I sent them to Nicole, like, should I buy these? And it felt like everybody I knew was making them because pattern testers were posting them and people were whipping them up as soon as they came out. And I'm sure plenty of beginner sewists have looked at these trends and might feel stressed out over not being able to sew a specific pattern. But that kind of stress, I guess, like sucks all the joy out of actually sewing. Yeah, totally. And I remember feeling the same way when I was newer. Um, I have a lot of patterns that I was like, I must have these because everyone else has them. And fabric to an extent. And it's just like, you know, this, the pressure that we put on ourselves or I put on myself to, to do it, you know, to, to make these things that other people were making. It wasn't, it wasn't good for me. So we, we have to stop comparing our own makes with other people's makes. So, you know, who knows how much longer they've been sewing, you know, or how much time they can devote to it. And also just because we can't see the imperfections in other people's makes, it doesn't mean that they're not there. It's just a, tiny Instagram post and that tiny screen that you're probably looking at on your phone, you know, it's not going to capture the sort of detail that, that we have when our own makes are right in front of us. So now that we've covered the ways that imposter syndrome can show up in our sewing practice, let's talk about who's more prone to imposter syndrome. Now, imposter syndrome has been definitively correlated with individuals from families with high expectations of achievement in combination with little or inconsistent praise or affirmation of that achievement, and sometimes for individuals with overprotective paternal figures. Now, listeners, Ada, does this sound familiar in any way? (laughs) A little bit. So to our Asian listeners, I swear I can almost hear you nodding in my recording space. Like (laughs) ethnic minorities, especially women and Asian Americans, are definitely more prone to experiencing imposter syndrome because of these characteristics. Now, being in a new setting can also invoke that feeling of imposter syndrome. Like we see this happening a lot in academic areas. It's frequently documented among grad students. And if you're not in academia, you know, you're not off scot-free. Individuals may (laughs) feel it in their, their relationships. Like in this case, they often feel like they've tricked their friend or partner into liking them or spending time with them. And it's present in all genders, right? And it doesn't seem to discriminate. So Likely, imposter syndrome is frequently seen as a female phenomenon because males are less likely to discuss or disclose, you know, feelings like such that we're talking about with imposter syndrome. And when they do disclose those feelings, they get a lot of or they get more applause or recognition. So, for example, at my last company, one of our co-founders, co-CEOs, who is a straight white male from Australia who happens to also be a billionaire, admitted to having imposter syndrome and got applauded for his candor during a all hands or town hall meeting with the company. And meanwhile, women and femmes have been discussing and dealing with these feelings forever. And you don't really see us getting all that applause, <laughs> to which I say down with the patriarchy, like F He's that. so brave. And He's so brave. Right. He's so brave, right? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> he has a billion dollars. I don't know. So relatable. <laughs> Anyways, according to the research that we did for this episode, around 70 to 80 percent of women in academia and executive jobs have reported feeling some form of imposter syndrome. And some studies show that there's equal prevalence among men, while some studies do not. But again, I can't really help but wonder how different factors play into the sort of data that we're seeing, right? Our researcher for this episode, Cindy, brought up that there is a societal expectation that women will experience some form of imposter syndrome. Therefore, there are two to three times as many studies on women and imposter syndrome specifically, and very few, if any, focused on men and imposter syndrome. Additionally, I would say women in 
high levels of academia or corporate America are more likely to be continually reminded that they are the exception and not the norm. So on a related note, it is usually harder to find mentors for them with a similar background, which could mean that these women feel less supported and thus are more prone to feeling imposter syndrome. Okay, I want to start looking at the intersection between our Asian identities and imposter syndrome, but that's a lot easier said than done. (laughs) Now, imposter syndrome is not classified as a mental illness, like we said earlier, which means that there are very few empirical studies about it. So in our research, we only found casual surveys that are not necessarily statistically significant, and they were primarily conducted by asking a single population whether they experience imposter syndrome. Instead, a better approach would have been to survey a wider population and then compare incident rates if you're if you're into statistics. Um, but like <laughs> but it's true, you know, the um, studying data in this way tends to or does is proven to give uh, better results when studying pretty much anything. And the studies that we found that were conducted with undergrad and college students always lumped all Asians under an Asian American category, quote unquote. Then most studies that primarily were focused on women had no breakdown between race. So again, we have some thoughts to share from our researcher, Cindy, who does want to call out that these are heavily based on anecdotal evidence only. She does see a lot of correlation between certain family situations and the quote unquote, typical Asian family background, at least based on anecdotal evidence from Asian American friends. And as a reminder, the circumstances in which individuals may be prone to imposter syndrome include being in a family with high expectations of achievement in combination with little or inconsistent praise and affirmation of achievement, or being in a family that has an overprotective paternal figure. Now, these family situations often have authoritarian and patriarchal parenting styles, little affirmation from the authority figures in the family, but high expectations simultaneously. Now, when you combine that with Asian Americans having a relatively high depression and suicide rate, along with the lack of representation in many fields, this seems like a perfect recipe for imposter syndrome. Now, when we looked into the state of imposter syndrome in Asia, a lot of articles we found during our research for the episode, again, were anecdotal. We found a couple of articles from China, Singapore, and India that seemed to indicate that imposter syndrome is somewhat discussed in Asia. And if you're interested, head over to our show notes and check them out. Now, the discussion still is skewed toward female, and it's discussed to a lesser extent in Asia compared to how much it comes up in the United States and other Western countries, and probably because the concept of a career woman in Asia is even newer. Right. And if you've noticed that I'm uncomfortable with this topic, we will get into why. So we finally reached the part of the episode where I can talk about why I struggle with explicitly calling it imposter syndrome. I want to start by bringing up a relevant Harvard Business Review article that was published in February of this year called Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. It is definitely an interesting read, and I highly encourage all listeners to check it out. It will be linked in our show notes. Even if you don't identify as a woman or you're not a person of color, the article, it basically challenges the concept of imposter syndrome, right? Like the writers state that imposter syndrome is a label often applied to women, but is problematic because it completely excludes the effects of systemic racism, classism, xenophobia, and other biases. So the concept of imposter syndrome takes a fairly universal feeling of discomfort second guessing and mild anxiety in the workplace and pathologizes it or slaps a label on it by calling it a condition or a syndrome, which we have stated multiple times, it is not officially in the DSM-5. It is not recognized by professionals as a official condition or syndrome. Now, in the article writer's opinion, the answer to overcoming imposter syndrome is not to fix individuals, but to create an environment that fosters a number of different leadership styles and where diversity of racial, ethnic, and gender identities is viewed as just as professional as the current model, which basically kind of sums up all of my feels. (laughs) I feel like most of the time that I've heard about or read about imposter syndrome, it is coming from a very white lens. And so it's hard for me to, or I can't really relate to mostly cis white men and women being like, it's so hard for me to believe I'm good enough. I must have imposter syndrome. Like, 
I am very well aware of the sexist and racist BS that I have had to put up with and continue to deal with every day of my life. And so I've had so many other things going on that I've never felt compelled to add my own, you know, self-doubt on top of that. And if anything, I've worked in enough toxic workplaces and teams now to be able to quickly identify when coworkers or management are trying to inflict that self-doubt upon me for various reasons, right? And it's I'm it's going to sound cocky. Like I will sound like I am a little too self-assured. But at this point in my life, I know I am good. <laughs> I know I'm smart. I know I'm hardworking. I know I have potential, right? I have proven this time and time again to myself and others. And am I awkward at accepting compliments around these things or compliments in general? Yes. But I would say that that awkwardness comes more from like culturally being raised to be humble and be gracious and not to be boastful. And so that is why it's awkward for me to even say these things. <laughs> so like, I know I'm not perfect. I'm always learning. I'm always trying to improve. And I'm always trying to be grateful for the privileges I have and aware of the privileges that I don't have. And so, like I said before, when at my last company, the two co-founders and co-CEOs, both of whom are straight white men who are billionaires, were complaining. And one of them was saying that, you know, he had imposter syndrome. They had faked their way to the top. Like my instant thought hearing that was like, how am I supposed to relate to this? Because I've never even been able to have the privilege or luxury to be able to fake my way to or through anything like that. Like I always have to have some sort of backup. And I know not everyone will kind of identify with this or agree with it. So Nicole, I'm curious, like, how do you feel about imposter syndrome? Yeah, um, so I, I read that Harvard Business Review article when it was first published. And at the time, I don't think I really fully processed that perspective because I so deeply related to the core of what imposter syndrome was. Like I've discussed in the podcast before how I've been diagnosed with depression and then later on anxiety. And so when I heard that there was a name for what I was feeling, it felt like validation, um, you know. Because inherent to imposter syndrome and a lot of depression and anxiety is self-blame for what you are experiencing. So to know that it's a phenomena that occurs for whatever reason, you know, and we talk about, do we blame ourselves? Is it a systemic societal issue? Um, it just helped me <laughs> to identify it and say, oh, I am not, and I don't use this word lightly, I am not crazy. Like I am not, what I'm experiencing is a real thing. So in revisiting the article for this episode, I understand that the article is like what it's saying about imposter syndrome isn't an individual pathology, but a problem that arises as a result of systemic issues of racism, classism, sexism, all the isms. Yeah. All the but isms. I do think it's still on <laughs> me to work through my issues and trauma that relates to it, but I get it now. Like it's both shitty and incorrect to place the blame and the burden on those dealing with these types of feelings as a, then rather than addressing or, or taking a look at the systemic problems that contribute to why people feel this way. And I remember when we started talking about planning for this episode and Ada, you brought up your feelings about imposter syndrome in this regard, like everything that you just said. And I had to go back to the article and read it and digest it. Uh, it took, like I did, like, it took <laughs> a few reads, but, but I get it. And Ada, you're totally awesome and good and capable and all those things. So you don't have to qualify it as sounding cocky. And I was thinking when I was, we were preparing for this, I was like, isn't, doesn't cocky have something to do with like male something like male, oh, like, <laughs> yeah, right, like, 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 a, like, a, like a cock, <laughs> like, you know, not, not like the actual chicken, right? Like it's, and, yeah. you know, I also think, you know, objectively, like I'm great at a lot of things. I, you know, it's taking, Thank you. you oh, it's taken me a long time and a lot of therapy and a lot of love to, you know, realize it. Self-love, love from others. And like, I have to say it out loud. I have to say, <laughs> I am great at public speaking. Like, podcast notwithstanding, I think I'm pretty damn good at it. I am an excellent writer. You do not want to get on my bad side if you're writing to me and expect to write something written back. <laughs> I also kick ass at invisible zippers. It's my superpower. Ooh. And... I have to say it all out loud, but for me, it's not faking my way to the top, but it's really, I just have to convince myself that these things are true. I know them to be true, but I have to hear them. And, and if other people aren't going to say it, like I got to say it. And I really, I just wish I were more like you, Ada, where I'm like, I have no, I have no, you know, or maybe you do, but like, 
more confident in your, your abilities. And it's like, whatever society is telling me, you know, it's all BS. Like I am actually good at what I do <laughs> and I know where I need improvement and, and all that. And, uh, and I thought of the word cocksure, <laughs> like, like you're talking about <laughs> cocky and I was like, you're so cocksure and I love it. And it's, it's kind of a, an old timey word, but it feels right. Yeah, you wrote that, and I was like, today I learned a new word. <laughs> like it's been, you think if you think about it, it's been a while since you've had to learn any new words. So, thank you for being my walking thesaurus and dictionary, and also you are fantastic <laughs> at public speaking. I have seen the videos you sent me. One, you are a fantastic writer, and you do kick ass at invisible zippers, and I would say all sewing with knits. Like getting better. You're you're pretty pretty good at sewing with knits. I mean, sewing in general, but yeah, I I would say like I look at your knits and I'm like, I wish I had the patience. <laughs> you do. do you that. just would wanna just whenever you feel like applying it, you'll get it. I'm sure. Yeah. No. I mean, I think I think everything you have shared is valid. I think everybody, regardless of if you have depression or anxiety or not, experiences self doubt at some point. I guess my problem with it is like when we internalize it so deeply because it is the topic du jour, right, in mainstream media and we're being told by Harvard Business Review and all these other places, like, you are a woman in the workplace. You should have imposter syndrome because 80% of the people do. Like, what if you are that 20%? That's not nothing. And I do think that it's, if you experience any type of self-doubt, it is worth inspecting I guess and digging into where that's coming from like is it coming from you and your experiences and your environment or is it coming from you know external factors in the situation that you're placed in and it is and I want to say it's like an evolution right like it's it's constantly something that can be changing especially if you are in different situations right between work and life and sewing yeah. even right so next up we we want to share with you some of some of our you know specific stories and examples relating to imposter syndrome so you got our general feel about both about imposter syndrome <laughs> from the both of us and uh, we just want to talk about you know how ada and i both deal with this you know concept of of imposter syndrome and you know it may be a bit of a problematic label as you know the article mentioned we talked about but it doesn't mean we haven't questioned ourselves and our ability to succeed at life now, for me, imposter syndrome uh, shows up at work a lot. Uh, when I, particularly when I first started my previous job, uh, previous being the one I like literally just left, um, and I'm in between at the moment <laughs> of recording, but I will be at my new job when this comes out. Now, I just left legal marketing, where I had become somewhat of an expert to go into immigration practice. There was a very specific electoral mm-hmm. event that happened in 2016 um, that pushed me from wanting to just casually do pro bono to being more full-time in immigration. And switching fields didn't come easy. There was a lot of work and study to do, and I had to lean on other people's expertise, but sometimes it would be really hard. Like I would be hard on myself. I'd be like, why don't you know this? And in hindsight, I just didn't. (laughs) And it was okay. Like why would would (laughs) I be expected to be an immigration expert when I hadn't been practicing or studying? Um, you know, and then the time came for me to teach other people. So my my previous job, I'd spent um, working on supporting other people's legal practice. So I was the expert, at, and then I would provide mentorship and uh, technical legal assistance on substantive immigration law issues and practice issues, all that. And I, so I did training. I trained other people, and I. At the very beginning, I was freaking out because I felt like I was only one step ahead of the people I was teaching. And I would rehearse and I would work overtime to get whatever I was, whatever I was, you know, presenting on perfect, whatever perfect is. And I really had to reframe my thinking. Like first, when it came to legal practice, I realized like it wasn't actually great to know everything off the top of your head. Like, like being an expert (laughs) doesn't mean it's all in here and you never need to crack open a book or look up a statute or a regulation or blah, blah, blah. And I think that's where law school gets it wrong. Like, like. (laughs) <laughs> you have to memorize a lot and yes there's a lot of critical thinking involved yep. but like the bar exam is memorization like that's what they make you do yeah and you know true. asking questions looking up stuff actually makes you a better lawyer it doesn't make you an inadequate one but being in the position I was at you know I felt like 
I was inadequate. <laughs> like, like I was not a good lawyer because I felt so behind on things and that I was still teaching myself. And, you know, a, therapy helped me a lot with this. There was a time in my life before I started that new job where I had just started therapy because it was necessary for me, like just period. It was necessary. And with the help of my therapist, you know, I figured out that I needed to focus on like what I am and not what I'm supposed to be, whatever that looks like. And one fallback that I like to, to fall back on is that I like, I don't know if this is necessarily (laughs) helpful or healthy, but when things became really difficult for me to understand, like I felt stupid. Like, I just felt like, why am I not getting this? You are a lawyer. Why are you not getting this? And, you know, I think all of us have had those moments where we, we beat ourselves up for not being again, what we're supposed to be quote unquote. And I, one thing that helped again, I don't know if this is like good, but I would tell myself, I don't lie. So I don't fake my way to the top. I don't lie. And I don't misrepresent who I am when I go for jobs. And the person that hired me believed that I could do this. And so, yeah, exactly. That's why they hired I don't feel it. Even if I'm sitting there like, I don't know. Yeah. I would be like, okay, (laughs) she knows who I am. And I, uh, she hired me and I have to remember that. And that if she, because she thinks that I could do it, you know, I can do it. And, you know, therapy helped with that too, you know, like a lot. And, and I think that, you know, it's whatever your feelings of therapy, like it has helped me a lot. And I think that I am always an advocate for having a third party to help you sort through your shit. Um, and it's always a very good thing. Now my sewing practice, I felt imposter syndrome bubbling up when I was selected to be a fabric mart fabricista. Uh, so it's one of those relationships where the store sends you fabric for free in exchange for a blog post on their website. And when I was selected to be part of this network and then took a look at who else was selected to be part of the network, I immediately felt the pressure. Like I needed to go above and beyond. (laughs) And, you know, the act of taking a look at who else was around me was, was that imposter syndrome. Like that's how it showed up because there were so many people that were selected that I was a fan of, that I was like, they are amazing. Mm. They're, I love their work. I love their skill. I love their style. And suddenly I was part of this pantheon of psoas. And I was like, oh no, this was a mistake. <laughs> like I am not like these people, uh, men and women, like they're them and I'm me. Like you can, for listeners, like my hand goes up for them. My hand comes down for me. And I felt like the only way that I could earn my spot, quote unquote, was like go all out. So my first post went out in February and I made three dang outfits, three whole separate outfits, three different patterns, three photography sessions, three times the writing. It was it was a lot. I mean, it was too much. And that's, you know, I've scaled it back, but that's really a classic way that it's shown up for me. It's like, I don't belong here with these people. They're amazing and I'm not. But the truth is, I am. <laughs> you are. Those outfits are amazing. If you haven't seen them, you should go check out Nicole's yeah. grid. Mm-hmm. They're on your grid, right? Yeah. Scroll back on her grid. They are fantastic. I will say, like, on on those notes, first of all, coming from a marketing background, like, I guess I would want anybody to know who listens to our podcast that when you see these sponsored posts and people are just receiving con- like free fabric for content that is actually like the cheapest way that yeah. companies generate content and this is coming from someone who used to mm-hmm. pay people yeah. to write content <laughs> and get paid to write content and so gifts in kind like that are the cheapest way because if you think about it like the fabric costs them max what 50 yeah that, and that's that's the retail value is what we get but whatever their wholesale yeah is what, what Cost the them. wholesale value is yeah it's probably half that if not less um based on my understanding of kind of wholesale rates and so for them it is a very very cheap way to get content and it's usually quality content because people are trying mm-hmm. to do a good job with their makes and and post really well because they feel some sort of obligation and it's to me, I'm kind of like, I hear your story and I'm like, but you are like, everybody who's doing that is fantastic. And I have many thoughts and feelings about like marketing in the sewing industry, which is for another time and another topic. But to be selected, I mean, I think that means that yeah. you, they saw something in you, right? That they wanted your content. 
which brings me to kind of you made a comment about like why don't you know this and I had a job a few jobs ago where I was the only marketing person for a startup that went from 25 people to more than 100 in the time that I was there the only marketing person supporting up to it went from a sales team of like five to like a sales team of 50 and I was expected to by our CEO generate thousands of leads on less than ten thousand dollars per quarter which yeah on a math what basis like is yeah yeah pennies on the dollar (laughs) it's it's, and and specifically that niche was literally 10 to 50 times cheaper than what bigger players were doing and at the time i just didn't know that that was an unrealistic expectation and so i was basically like the director of marketing and i was 24 or 25 looking around being like I'm working 100 hours a week doing all these things. Like, why can't I do it all? Well, because A, I like wouldn't have known all of it because there was no one there to teach me. And I was learning it on the job, Googling it as I went, talking to people and building my network. But I didn't realize until I got to the next job where I had a team to support me and I had other teams that I could lean on that I'd been put up to completely Mm -hmm. unrealistic expectations that were inflicting self-doubt upon my own skills and then when I told those people that I was working with all the things that I had done at my last job they were like holy cow you did all that by yourself <laughs> and like, it was definitely very validating but I can understand why if you're in the moment like looking back I understand why in the moment I was like struggling to be honest. Well, and that's just really struggling. That's what the HBR Um, article was talking about, right? That like, it wasn't you, like it wasn't you. It was the system. It wasn't me. Set you up to, to fail number one, and then cause you to believe that it was your fault or it was your issue and and not really the way that um, the, the position and the expectations were set up. So that's messed up. Yeah. And so I think it was like having that perspective of being in both situations that really caused me to question, I guess, imposter syndrome. But back to sewing. (laughs) I think when I hit like a thousand followers on my sewing account, I was like, whoa, like people actually want to see what I'm posting here because I'm posting a lot of mistakes, let's be honest. And my sewing Instagram, my sewing account, sewing Finsta, uh, for I don't know what that means. Young and hip people out there who know what a, a, a Finsta is. Like, I think it's short for oh. fake Instagram. It's it's like not your like true account where you post your like real life stuff or whatever. Not that I think anything on Instagram is really real life. But um, it you know, my sewing account started really as like a different place where I could curate a separate feed of sewing content and share my own makes and my learnings to give back to the sewing community because I'd picked up so much from other people's experiences. And um, basically, I wasn't really trying to build a following, (laughs) which I find completely ironically because I am trying to build a following on my business account and it feels like it's just going really slowly and it is a constant uphill climb and struggle. And I know different audiences, different focuses and For those of you who follow me on both, I am eternally grateful, seriously. Um, But anyways, am I happy that folks have found my sewing Instagram and chosen to join me in my sewing journey? Yes. I also credit a lot of this growth to, like I can trace it back to specifically larger sewing accounts, Leela, Jillian, and Lisa specifically, who shared my content and amplified my call for help when we were starting the podcast. So with all of these new followers did I feel like at some point I should constantly be posting or being on Instagram kind of sometimes I do try to be mindful I think of my own screen time between fun and work and like not only my laptop screen but both my work phone and my personal phone so honestly I'm not really fussed if I don't post on my sewing Instagram for a few weeks there are now times where I will wear a make that I have not photographed realize I have not photographed it and be like, whatever, next time I'm going to put it in the wash because it's dirty and I'll photograph it later and it'll go on the feed at some point. But do I get stressed when I don't post on my business account? Absolutely. Because I know that it is a hamster wheel that you kind of have to keep running on. I think for me, the best thing that I've done is for my own mental health, separating, physically separating things. So I mentioned I have a work phone 
and a personal phone. So I am not ashamed to admit that I bought a refurbished iPhone solely for the purposes of managing my work social media because it is it is like a significant time chunk yeah. of my day every day and not only is that iPhone actually better for, than my Android phone for creating content but it is also only connected to Wi-Fi so I can't check on it all the time like if I go outside and I'm not connected to Wi-Fi it's not going to update. Can't do anything. I can also physically put it away or ignore it whenever I want. And I think setting that boundary really helped me feel less pressured to be constantly posting on there and constantly updating things. And it's like a little <laughs> bit of like church yeah. and state separation, you know, for lack of a better term. And I know, I know buying a refurbished iPhone or second phone isn't within everyone's reach, but if you can afford one or if you have an old phone lying around or you just need an idea, like every person I've told that I <laughs> do this to, they're like, oh my gosh, that's that's such a good idea. Because I do think when it's all just on one place that we already spend a lot of our time looking at, it is very easy to kind of get sucked in and then like ha- get caught up, I think, a lot of the time, especially on sewing Instagram, because there's always something new and someone like making mm-hmm. something like amazing. That. And yeah, I've, been, I've definitely been caught up on sewing Instagram with regard to like feeling, yeah, just <laughs> we talked about earlier about comparing, you know, so I don't know if it's necessarily comparing for me. I think it's looking at someone and wanting to do what they mm-hmm. do. That sounds like comparison. <laughs> but mm-hmm. yeah, I just think. Or yeah, like have and then, you know, what, what they're happening making. Is that, like I endlessly scroll and then I get unhappy with myself and I and I spend a lot of time on it. And you know, it and the the behavior of following others on Instagram and like, you know, other social media platforms is totally, you know, ripe for breeding imposter syndrome. Like it encourages acts of comparing yourself, like I said, and then also questioning why people are interested in you, which is kind of a little bit about what you said earlier. Um, But there's also, I think, some opportunity to combat the systemic issues regarding imposter syndrome on social media. Like there's some good to social media. (laughs) And, you know, you can do things like increase representation (laughs) of marginalized identities on the platform, like on the whole. And, you know, through concerted efforts by ideally companies and institutions, but, you know, communities and individuals holding each other up. And uh, on an individual level, you know, positive feedback, validation, compliments can go a long way toward helping people overcome their own insecurities. And to go back to the Harvard Business Review article, there are systemic issues that need to be addressed to really break down imposter syndrome, though for my part, I think we can and should recognize its effects on the individual, like work on it in our own lives and also do things that support others who might be feeling this way. And it's also a big reminder for our listeners, like we don't want to pretend like we know, know it all. <laughs> Absolutely Like not. pretty much about nothing. <laughs> you know, like, no, you know, invisible <laughs> zippers. Come on. Yeah. I do know invisible zippers and, uh, you know, but, you know, we don't have a comprehensive framework on how to tackle imposter syndrome, but if that's what you're looking for, you know, instead of anecdotes you can identify with, there is a New York times article called how to overcome imposter syndrome. That's worth looking into that will be in our show notes. Right. And so in this episode, we hope we have helped you better understand what imposter syndrome is and what it looks like both in sewing and the work world, I guess. But also, I hope we've given you a little bit of food for thought about the problematic nature of the term itself, right? Take care of yourself. Don't be so hard on your most recent make or your most recent makes. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. Next week, we will be joined by Joy Mao, who is a fiber artist, owns a small batch studio, and is also an artist in residence at WOW Project, which is a woman, queer, and trans-led community initiative that uses art and activism to grow and protect New York City's Chinatown's creative culture in a time of rapid change. If you like our show, please consider supporting us on Coffee. Your financial support helps us with overhead expenses and will allow us to give back to our all-volunteer team who works so hard to provide you with new content each week. The link to our coffee page is ko-fi.com slash Asian Sewers Collective. And you can also find the link in the show notes on our website and on our Instagram account. Our Instagram is at Asian Sewers Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewers Collective. And you can also help us out by spreading the word and telling your friends. 
We would also appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All of the links and resources mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website. That's asiansoistcollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you want to be featured on future episodes at asiansoistcollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts, Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline. This episode was researched by Cindy Chan, produced by Mariko Abe, and edited by Henry Wong. Thank you so much to our other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sewist Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next week.